my presentation today is going to be on osteochondroma and multiple hereditary exostoses. Um, it's a common one that pops up in the exam. Hopefully, uh, some of the junior burgers might get uh, a little bit of knowledge out of this they didn't have before. Osteochondroma is a benign hematomatous osteocartilaginous tumour arising from the surface of the bone. Uh, it forms about 50% of benign bone tumours and has a male-female ratio of about 1.5 to 1. It's also known as an exostosis, hence uh, MHE, which we'll talk about later. What's actually going on here? Well, it's thought to be a defect in the perichondral ring of LaCroix, um, where the physis uh, penetrates through and it's allowed to extend through to the surface of the cortex, and then it proceeds to ossify using endochondral ossification, um, which then uh, comprises the stalk of the lesion. The key appearance features um, are that it can be either pedunculated or sessile, and it always arises from the bone surface. One of the key findings is that the trabecular lines uh, from the, uh, continue from the cortex, and you get this uh, marrow space that's continuous with that of the bone. It uh, always points away from the physis, and it stops growing after skeletal maturity and it's usually metaphyseal based. It's uh, typically not found in the clavicle or skull because these are bones that undergo membranous ossification. This is an MRI slice showing the characteristic <coughs> cartilage cap. And um, uh, you can see on the histology slice as well that uh, lighter blue cartilage cap that you see. Differentials, uh, paraosteal osteosarcoma, periosteal osteosarcoma, heterotopic ossification or myositis and uh, always keep in mind chondrosarcoma. We'll talk a little bit more about sarcomatous change later. Cap size is something that's commonly spoken about. Um, typically in a solitary lesion, there's less than a 1% lifetime risk of malignant transformation. And if it does transform, it's usually a low-grade chondrosarcoma. It's slow growing and it rarely metastasized at discovery. Cartilage cap of more than two centimeters, um, some sources say 15 millimeters, uh, is concerning, uh, and that's only applicable in adults. Uh, you need to be aware that in skeletally immature patients, um, they can have a large cartilage cap and uh, fear not. Beware the newly painful lesion, any lesion that's still enlarging after skeletal maturity or destruction of subchondral bone or soft tissue mineralization, uh, which would uh, indicate a chondrosarc. Um, axial and sessile lesions more commonly transform, so pelvic lesions in particular, and anything that's hot on bone scan. Symptoms, these are mostly asymptomatic, um, can be managed with observation. Um, patients typically complain of lumps and bumps that they notice. And really, the symptoms revolve around space-occupying symptoms, such as bursitis, impingement, nerve compression. It can get tendon subluxation, uh, particularly around the pes, um, and restricted range of motion. Uh, they can also lead to growth deformities, which we'll talk a bit more about. So what's the treatment of a um, isolated uh, osteochondroma? Usually observation. Um, if you have any signs of malignant transformation, tendon or neurovascular impingement, or you want to restore ROM or correct deformity, then uh, you can do an on-block excision. And the key there is that you want to remove the entire chondral cap. The general advice is to delay until skeletal maturity uh, to increase the chance of local control. Um, and another thing to be aware about is uh, a patient with an osteochondroma extending into the popliteus fossa can have a pseudoaneurysm and is at risk of vascular injury during excision. So preoperative MRI can help define that local anatomy and plan your approach. So let's get to the more interesting stuff, which is multiple hereditary exostoses. Um, in the uh, exam this year, they actually had this as a case, and one of the examiner questions was, uh, what's another name for MHE? <laughs> And they were after diaphyseal eclasis. I think it was just a bit of an interest uh, question and not commonly referred to that anymore. Autosomal dominant. It's got a 96% penetrance in females and 100% in males. And uh, it involves the tumour suppressor genes, AXT1, AXT2 and AXT3. Patients with AXT1 have a more severe presentation. They have higher rates of chondrosarcoma. They have more exostoses. 
more limb malalignment and more pelvic and flat bone involvement. Um, these tumor suppressor genes are involved in the production of heparin sulfate and they affect the prehypertrophic chondrocytes, the physis. So this leads to multiple uh, osteochondromas and it can lead to growth disturbance as well. A lot of these patients have short stature, which we can talk about later. Sarcomatous change, um, 5 to 10% risk of malignant transformation uh, in MHE compared to the 1% of osteochondroma. Secondary osteochondrosarc, as we've mentioned, usually low grade and very rare to see in the paediatric population. You should be thinking about this in that 30 to 50 year old age group and this is treated with wide surgical resection. And this is some imaging which shows the characteristic uh, coxa valga that you can get with a lesser trochanter lesion. And then above that at the pelvis level, you see this mineralization and destruction of that medullary continuity of the osteochondroma uh, with a soft tissue expansion. Manifestations and management considerations. So the key things to remember are all the various ways this presents itself and what deformities we, we commonly see. We know you'll get multiple lumps and bumps and deformities, but short stature is commonly seen. Limb length discrepancies uh, can be an issue. Typically, these patients have a lot of valgus, if you're struggling to remember this. They have coxa valga, genu valgus, and uh, ankle valgus as well. Um, they can have asymmetric pectoral and pelvic girdles. And uh, in addition to that, it's very common to see a scapula, um, a scapula or rib osteochondroma, which can lead to winging or snapping scapula syndrome. And one of the areas that we commonly screen for is, is a dislocated uh, radial head due to ulnar shortening and radial bowing as well. With all these patients, we want to do a full neurovascular exam because uh, they typically get, they can get uh, common perineal nerve uh, involvement or any other nerve compressions as well. And scoliosis uh, has also been reported. Um, typically, these osteochondromas are in the posterior elements and these patients can get um, myelopathy, uh, although rare, in there's increasing literature to uh, show that. So the forearm deformity um, is present in up to 70% of these patients. Typically it's ulnar shortening and radial bowing, um, dislocation in the radial head in up to a third, and, uh, and the main finding you'll see there is a loss of pronation. You can get DAUJ disruption, ulnar deviation, ulnar translocation of the carpal bone, and shortening of the ulna is the key feature which um, differentiates it from matter lungs uh, when you just look at the x-ray. So the theory behind this is that the growth of the osteochondroma overwhelms and retards the growth of any closely associated physis, resulting in a tethering effect on paired structures. Larger lesions with greater cortical involvement tend to influence bone growth more substantially than do smaller lesions. And another thing that helps remember all this is that bones with a smaller cross-sectional diameter tend to be shortened more considerably when affected by MHE. So the ulna and the fibula, which uh, is an easy way to remember why you get the deformities you do. Masada described a classification um, which may help guide management, but I think is more descriptive. Um, distal ulna exostoses with... Uh, with shortening is the most common one, which is a type one, where the radius uh, maintains length. Uh, type two is when you see radial head dislocations, and type A uh, has an proximal radial exostosis, and type B does not. Type three is when you have an exostosis on the, uh, on the radius and you get um, relative ulnar positive variance. So controversy in this field, early surgery is often recommended um, and the indications of that's painful lesions, increased radial articular angle, progressive ulnar shortening, excessive carpal slip, loss of pronation or, or bowing. Um, type 1 deformity, uh, Masada recommends an exostosis excision, radial osteotomy and immediate ulnar lengthening. Um, Early osteochondroma excision can decrease or halt the progression of deformity, however it doesn't consistently provide a full correction. Ulnar translocation of the carpal bones can be treated with an ulnar lengthening, which is a Z-cut osteotomy. It can also be done over a frame. Um, however, it's been noted that ulnar shortening is likely to recur. And radiocarpal angulation can be treated with osteochondroma excision 
and a distal radial osteotomy or a hemiphysial tethering if they have sufficient growth remaining, um, which uh, has shown particularly good results with um, cosmesis and modest results in improved function. This is from the JS article, how they propose you do that. Um, the key there is that they do a Z-lengthening over, uh, over a frame, uh, which they then remove, and they use the closing wedge graph to fill that in uh, for the lateral closing wedge of the, um, of the radius. Dislocation of the radial head, again, another contentious issue. Historically, they recommended excision of the radial head, removal of exostosis, and radial osteotomy and ulnar lengthening, which again can occur over an external fixator or a Z-lengthening. Attempts at radial head relocation have not consistently proven to be successful, however. And there is controversy whether early, surg whether early surgery outcomes are superior to those untreated patients. Um, untreated patients, as with a lot of uh, children with hand and forearm deformities, adapt very well. Only 13% report appreciable pain or limitations. However, with objective functional assessment, um, they were below two standard deviations of a normal population. Uh, at the children's, uh, and certainly at Shriners as well, um, the general trend here is uh, that we tend to observe rather than operate on these dislocated radial heads. And as mentioned earlier, the research shows that they have a, um, an excellent cosmetic result, which can be important to these patients. However, functionally, um, only modest improvements. In the hand, all you need to remember here is that ulnar metacarpals and proximal phalanges uh, tend to be involved and they're usually asymptomatic and brachydactyly is common, even without any exostoses on the x-ray. Lower extremity, um, we mentioned limb length discrepancy. Um, a limb length discrepancy of more than two centimetres is reported in up to 50% of these patients, typically more so in the femur than the tibia, and the treatment of that's, uh, as with any limb length discrepancy, the projected um, uh, final difference uh, at skeletal maturity and usually with these patients they'll be caught early enough to be managed in epiphysiodesis. Uh, the femur has coxa valga in up to 25% and can also have antiversion and that's due to a, a characteristic lesser trochanter exostosis and may uh, require early varus osteotomy. Um, acetabular dysplasia has also been reported uh, with acetabular um, exostoses. The knee, the valgus knee is up to 33% of cases and uh, can also be associated with patellar dislocations. Um, traditionally was thought to occur mostly in the tibia, however, we now know that it's both from the distal femur and the proximal tibia. And for the, for the tibial side, uh, it's that disproportionately shortened fibula that we spoke about earlier that, that drives it. So you have several correct, corrective osteotomies you can pick from. Um, if needed. Uh, femoral opening wedge tends to be our usual way of addressing valgus so that we don't restore, we don't create a joint line obliquity. Um, but again, you'd, you'd pick the option that corrects the deformity uh, at its maximal site. So that can be a high tibial osteotomy, or if they're skeletally uh, immature, we can do a proximal tibial hemiopyphysiodesis. Some children we've noticed compensate on their own uh, with an oblique joint line. Um, so they might have a severe valgus matched by a severe varus and have an overall neutral mechanical alignment. And we don't know whether this leads to um, early degenerate joint disease. The ankle, relative shortening of the distal fibula um, leads to oblique growth plate and joint line with medial subluxation of the talus. Um, they um, also get secondary changes in the talus uh, with an oblique um, tailor uh, body. The valgus deformity is in 50% of patients and decreased range of motion is a common complaint. Um, small distal tibial and fibular lesions can be followed until maturity. Uh, resection if there's substantial deformity and growth remaining. And the traditional described techniques in oblique osteotomy uh, through the distal fibula uh, to permit optimal exposure of the tibial exostosis, which tends to be on the lateral tibia. Um, medial hemiepiphyseal tethering is also an option, and in the more severe valgus or, or where the distal fibula physis is proximal to the tibial physis, uh, fibula lengthening has also been described. Supramalleolar, supramalleolar osteotomy is always an option as well.
and this is an example of medial tethering, um, which was uh, about, oh, sorry, uh, three years uh, apart, uh, showing that um, they've achieved a, a reasonable correction there. Spinal, we mentioned earlier, used to be considered very rare that patients would have uh, spinal cord compression, but newer studies with 3D imaging have shown that up to 15% of patients have evidence of this and with myelopathy. Um, so all I'd say on that is just be aware that it is an entity and it's um, worth checking for in these patients. So just wrapping up, there's a few things that look very similar to osteochondromas. Nora's lesion, we had one turn up to clinic the other day. Uh, bizarre parosteal osteochondromatous proliferation. Um, it's common in the small bones of the hands and feet in patients in their 30s and 40s. Uh, it's benign, however, it has a high recurrence rate of 50%. It's distinguished from osteochondroma as the medullary portion is not necessarily continuous with the host bone and it doesn't have a cartilage cap. Um, and the treatment is surgical excision. They usually have uh, quite a bit of irritation uh, and pain. Trevor disease is um, dysplasia of the epiphysialis hemimilica. It's an osteochondroma of the epiphysis. Um, and if not treated, it can result in premature degenerative arthritis. It's uh, very rare, but just something to be aware of. And this is a busy slide, but that's basically my one page cheat sheet on MHE to think about for the exam. Any questions? These are the references.